To remind you of something that you already know, there is a real genius to the separation of church and the state. This idea was forged out of the fires of the Reformation in the 16th century, in which Christian killed Christian over how they were being Christian. Uh, it, it was a hard moment in the history of the church and human history altogether. And, and out of the Reformation and then into the Enlightenment, the 17th century or so, um, there is this time in which it becomes clear that the church does need to be protected from the state, and the state needs to be protected from the church, and which is which depends upon the time and the context. But there's a real genius to, to putting the two as two separate structures. And because we live in a time where this is um, practiced and seen and acknowledged and, and legal, uh, the Johnson Amendment in 1954 makes it explicit and legally the law of the land, um, I am forbidden from telling you who to vote for. And I would actually resign if someone forced me, tried to force me to tell you who to vote for. Everyone has a few hills that they would die on. Welcome to one of, of mine. Uh, any pastor who says uh, who people should vote for is risking their, the church, that church's IR, IRS status as a non-for-profit. Uh, which is um, really kind of a fascinating thing to kick around. I think it would uh, be interesting if, if every time a pastor dared to cross that line and to tell people who to vote for, that that church just automatically lost its IRS recognition. And, and, the, and what would happen if you are not an IRS-recognized nonprofit? You pay property taxes. <laughs> I think it would actually be a good thing overall uh, if, if you want to cross that line. Okay, here's your consequence. Your church not pays property taxes. I think that would change things dramatically, quickly, and probably for the better. My particular response uh, to this year in which we live not only is to reinforce, to reiterate my commitment to this line of separation between church and state, um, is also to make sure we read one particular part of, of the Bible this year. In, this, in the midst of the politics through, swirling through our culture and our media, uh, I want to read something uh, that is deeply political, but maybe not something that you've thought of as such. I want to read Revelation. I think it is the needed antidote to the fear and anxiety that has become all too common. Do not be afraid is one of the most common refrains of Scripture. And after reading Revelation, I think we can say, do not be afraid. I think we can say, do not be afraid, and we can mean it uh, because we can see how Revelation lays out the kingdom of God to come. And that's why I say it's political. It's political, and that's pointing towards God's politics, and it's pointing towards the, the punchline of, of history. Right? Um, but it ends up being a book of hope. Uh, and, and that's what I want us to look at. And that's what we're going to do over this next month or so. So uh, let's dig in and let's start seeing what happens. Think for a minute when you read Revelation for the first time. What was your response? For me, I remember reading Revelation for the first time. I was at a church camp. I believe it was Lutherdale, a Lutheran camp, you might have guessed. And, and I... I uh, got out my flashlight, and I had a, a Bible, and I was reading uh, after lights out. And I figured if I got in trouble for still having the flashlight on, they couldn't be too angry at me because I was reading the Bible. So I, re I was reading Revelation. And um, it was very confusing. I did not like it, and so I ignored it. I, I just stopped, and, and I just ignored it, and uh, that's what happened, right? It was confusing, bleh. And I think that's what happens with a lot of people reading Revelation, is that we either get frustrated by it and ignore it, or we try to figure it out and get frustrated by it and then, then move on. And so uh, it is my duty today to apologize to you on behalf of the church for not equipping you to be able to understand Revelation. For too long it has been avoided, either because it has been misunderstood or uh, because those who understood it are worried about rocking the boat. Uh, you see, 
we have really learned how to read Revelation. It's, in, it's been the last uh, couple generations that we have sort of rediscovered um, how to read apocalyptic literature. That's what Revelation is. It's a piece of apocalyptic literature. And, and to be clear about who I credit uh, for teaching me this is a guy by the name of James Eford, E-F-I-R-D. Uh, if you want to um, learn more about what we're talking about, you can go on Amazon, look up E-F-I-R-D, James Eford. Um, and, he, and he writes uh, books about, about this, introdu an introduction to apocalyptic literature. And um, what he began, and, and Mickey Eford, Mickey was his nickname, um, he made it his task over decades of teaching to make sure that people could read the Bible and, and read it with this do not be afraid front and center. Like this is not a book of fear. It's a book of, of, of hope. It's a book uh, of hope written towards persecuted Christians uh, to give them hope to be able to turn towards the future and keep on keeping on. So as we get into the book itself, I need to make a comparison. And I think it's an essential comparison for being able to read Revelation well. The comparison we need to make is to political cartoons. Political cartoons, they're not as common in newspapers. Well, newspapers aren't as common. But uh, in general, a political cartoon is something that we're aware of in American culture. And in a political cartoon, it, it ends up being commentary on the day. And if we take a, a, a political cartoon, literally, we, we start to get things um, out of whack, right? Because literally, if we read a political cartoon, we would, say, we would read that a, a donkey and an elephant are nature's enemies, that, that a donkey and an elephant are fighting in, in nature. And we know that's not the case. What we know, we read a donkey and an elephant fighting in a politi political cartoon. What that tells us is that the Republicans and Democrats are, are fighting. They're symbols. There's a whole list of symbols that are used in political cartoons that we are able to understand because of the culture that we live in. Donkeys and elephants and eagles, stands for America. An old dude with a red, white, and blue and a top hat is Uncle Sam. Uh, nine figures in black robes is the Supreme Court. And so uh, we, there are some general rules, like land is rarely driven drawn to scale in a political cartoon. People are caricatured. Every president has a certain way that they're a caricature or something about them that is sort of taken out of proportion. So you can figure out who it is at first glance. Um, and if I wanted to teach you how to read political cartoons, I could. But what I would be teaching you is uh, the basics of, of American politics. The first challenge of reading Revelation is to understand that we're reading it from a different time and culture. And just like if someone from 300 years from now tried to read an American political cartoon, they would need a guide. Same thing with Revelation. We are not first century inhabitants of the Roman Empire. And so we don't have the same cultural context um, to, to be able to understand Revelation because Revelation is full of the, these symbols. A first century inhabitant of the Roman Empire uh, would be able to read Revelation for what it is, a letter that is full of symbols um, and offering hope for persecuted uh, Christians. It was offering hope. It was not ever meant to be a timeline. Uh, that We'll get into how Revelation gets viewed as a timeline in a, in a later sermon, but just for not, right now, let's hold on. Let's remember that, right? Um, and so there are, there, are, uh, there are some guidelines, and uh, here is rules for reading an apocalypse, right? That's, that's what this handout is. I'm going to hand it out on Sunday. Um, I'll see if I can put a link to it in the, the description of, of this video. Um, but in the same way, if you want to read political cartoons, I would give you a list of what the symbols mean in modern America. That's what this is for first century uh, Revelation, first century Roman culture. Um, and, and so you go through things, we see that colors have meaning, like white, red, black, and gray, uh, which come up in the four horsemen. Each, the white is victor, red is war, black is abstinence, pale or greenish gray is death. We see that the numbers all have uh, 
uh, symbolic meanings. No number in Revelation is a literal number. Three is the number of heaven. Four is the number of earth. Seven is complete. Ten is all is an inclusive number. Uh, um, Twelve is the people who follow God. Uh, there is concretization that happens. It's the Jewish idea where the first to do something becomes the reference for all those who follow and do the same. And so David wrote the first psalm, and so all the psalms are psalms of David. Were all the psalms written by David? Probably not, but he wrote the first psalm, so they're the psalms of David. And, and so Babylon comes up in Revelation, and Babylon is the one who invaded Jerusalem, and so anyone who invades Jerusalem is Babylon. Well, in this context, it's understood to be Rome. Uh, Elijah is the first great prophet, so the pro anyone when we're talking about the prophets, we're talking about what Elijah had to say, Elijah of the prophets. Um, and, and so Nero was the first Roman emperor to persecute Christians, and so all the emperors who persecute Christians are referred to as of Nero, and so it's concretized, made, made con that's how we refer to him. Um, and so th this is like just a road map or a guide of how we're going to read Revelation based upon the research that we have uh, done into uh, how this happened in the first century, what was the first century uh, culture. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to start with the end of the book of Revelation because there are some things, sometimes in reading a book where you, you got to know the punchline or else you get bogged down in the middle. Uh, Job is another one of those. You read the last couple chapters of Job before you try to read it front to back. It's just, it works out better. Uh, Revelation is, is the same. If we don't start at the end, we'll just get bogged down. We've got to have the, the, the punchline of Revelation 21 and 22, which is the hope that we're, we're driving towards. Uh, the hope um, that, that was the, the reason the original audience was, was reading this. Um, so, Revelation 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. The sea, uh, this is the start of some of the symbols used. The symbol uh, for when the sea shows up in, in, in Revelation, the sea is the source of, of chaos. It's the source of the beast back in chapter 13. Uh, and the beast in Revelation is the Roman Empire. And so um, to say that the sea is no more is to say that there's no more chaos. It has passed away, and now the, the earth, and the heavens have all been made new, a new heaven and a new earth. Dr uh, we'll continue reading. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will no be no more, for the first things has passed away. And what has passed away? What has passed away is the persecutions of the beast, the, the, the Roman Empire, have stopped. 21, 5 to 8. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. Write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. I, it is done. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. The promise of Revelation is that all things will be made new. Uh, the promise of Revelation is not that we go away to a better place, but the, that the place where we already live is made right. Missouri is made right. right? Wherever you're watching this from is made right. God, and to say Alpha and Omega is to name that God is at, is at the beginning and the end of all of our stories, of our lives themselves. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the polluted, the murderers, fornicators, sorcerers, idolaters, and liars, their place will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur. Those who turn away from God uh, will not only face the first death, which is the death that all face, but Revelation lays out that they face a second death, the separation from God. Um, when you get to a point where you're writing an apocalypse, this is what you're receiving from God, an, the, an apocalyptic vision is that uh, everything has become very black and white. There's not a lot of room for nuance in such situations where the persecution is so severe that you do not know whether you will live through it. Revelation 21.10, on following. And in that spirit, uh, he carried me away to a great high mountain. Uh, the he who's getting carried away is John uh, from the island of Patmos. And he showed me the holy city of Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. It has a great high wall with 12 gates. And at the 12 gates, 12 angels. And on the gates are inscribed the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. 
And so again, that number shows up, 12. 12 is the number of God's people. It's all of God's people. It is the 12 tribes, so it's the entirety, the 12 of the, all of the tribes of God's people, and it is they're living in the new Jerusalem, which is part of the new world, the world made right and true. The angel who, ta who talked to me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city, to measure the city and its gates. And so it goes through and measures, and whatever is measured in an apocalyptic writing is being protected. The wall is built of jasper, while the city is pure gold, clear as glass. The foundations of the wall of the city are adorned with every jewel, jasper, sapphire, agate, emerald, onyx, carnelian, chrysolite, beryl, topaz, chrysophase, jacinth, and amethyst. This is one of the differences between allegory and symbolism. Like in allegory, every detail is turned into some sort of meaning, and that's not the case. The, the um, revelation is symbolic. There are symbols that mean things, but sometimes you look at the detail and um, do the stones each mean something? Nope, they're just 12 precious stones. 12 tribes are precious. The, the nature of each stone does not tell us anything unique. That's not part of the, the genre that of the apocalyptic literature. But nothing unclean will enter, nor anyone who practices abomination or falsehood, only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Now, if Revelation was describing the end of all time, why would we worry if anything was uh, anything unclean, anyone who might lie might be around? Right? There's a sense in which Revelation is focused on the end of a time, and the focus on the end of this time is the end of the, per the times of persecution. And, and so it, Revelation isn't necessarily um, definitively a book about the end of all time. It's the end of a time. Uh, in, in Hebrew, the, there was no word for eternity in Hebrew. It was ha'olam, uh, the end of a time. And it could be a millennia, it could be a long time, but the end of this persecution is going to, it will come to an end. And that's what the hope they needed, the hope the, the people receiving this letter from John on Patmos needed, is that the, this persecution would be coming to an end. There was a better age coming, and there might be people who lie, but they will not be welcomed into the, the kingdom of God made right and true. Right, this, um, once we're through the persecutions, uh, we read in, in Revelation 22, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, through the middle of the street of the city. And either side of the river is the tree of life, with its twelve kinds of fruit, producing its fruit each month, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. So once the persecutions are done, what we're re the people of God are reading is that the healing of the nations, the tree b growing the 12 types of fruit will, will produce the fruit which will be for the healing of the nations, right? The purpose of the fruit is so that the Christians can continue to use that fruit for the healing, which, I mean, tells us, like, there's still a purpose left. There's still work to be done. There's still good work to be accomplished. This, this ending gives hope that on the other side of the persecution, if those who follow Jesus keep the faith that God will is going to be done, a new, way, new day will come, and that's, that's still true today. No matter what the persecution, that if we follow Jesus, uh, that if we who follow Jesus remain faithful, God's will is going to be done, uh, that Jesus, who is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, will have the last word, but just like you did in this situation, uh, that the emperor persecuting Christians, uh, Emperor Domitian, died shortly after this letter was written, uh, about within a year. Um, this letter was written in the year 94 or 95, and Domitian died in 96 AD. Uh, that because the persecution passed, that the Christians could then get back to working on God's will. Um, and, and so that, that's how we read the punchline of Revelation, that persecution, that that which is broken will be made right. That which is, per, the persecutions will pass. Um, and, and so I want to invite you to continue to read Revelation with me over this next month using this, this, this guide. Um, and if you want to go deeper and, and really kind of make a study of this, you're welcome uh, to pick up one of Mickey Eford's book, uh, Revelation for Today, um, with that, it, that goes through each chapter of Revelation or uh, Left Behind, a 
discussion of rapture, antichrist, and millennium. Uh, that looks at it sort of topically, if you want to look at it more topically. Um, and if you bring me any questions you have, I will gladly take a swing at them, though as always, I reserve the right to be wrong and to go do more research and to give you a better answer if I don't have one on the fly. I look forward to the coming weeks as we explore how this letter offers hope to people holding on to their faith in hard times, and the way it gives us a sense of, of scope, a sense of what, what matters. There's what matters, and then there's what matters even more. The election this fall matters, and so I hope you vote. I will vote. I hope everyone watching this votes. The election this fall matters, but what matters even more, what matters most, will not be determined by an election. It has already been determined on a hill far away on which stood an old rugged cross, as the old hymn goes. That this is our hope, that in the kingdom of God to come, when heaven comes to earth, we will see the fullness of revelation come to pass. And so our hope is built on our faith in Jesus Christ, and the, our citizenship in the end is in the kingdom which is to come, a kingdom that will have no end. Every other nation, every other kingdom will pass. There is only one kingdom which is eternal. That is our hope. That is what we, we root our, our faith in. That is what we, we confess. That's what we're praying for. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This election matters for now. Our faith in Jesus Christ matters forever. Amen.